Thank you very much. Okay, I think this is good. Um, I need to remember to hold it here. I don't sing too much, so I'm not used to that. Good morning. Um, my name is Erik Jan Bos in Dutch. I'm Dutch, I'm from the Netherlands, but I work for Norgenet, which is headquartered in Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, when Jan Grunterrad invited me a couple of months ago to be a speaker at this conference, I was delighted, I was honored. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, it was my pleasure to come here because I think Cessnet is one of the leading NRANs in Europe. Uh, so I'm proud to be here and to uh, paraphrase what Mr. Uh, Levac, is that his right name? Do I pronounce it right? What Dr. Levac said this morning, um, I think Cessnet is on par with Western European uh, organizations. I think that's too modest. I think Cessnet is on par with a lot of uh, global organizations. Uh, I think Cessnet is uh, one of the global leaders in this field. Uh, my talk is about a completely different talk, topic than the previous speaker. Uh, while the previous speaker talked about the breadth of the NREN, the broadness of the NREN, um, which you can see on this slide, um, this is what the NRENs do today, or the e-infrastructures do today. They take care of the network, they are a trusted party for identity management services, they do above the net services, uh, they do cloud services, they broker cloud services from the commercial market, and of course they're into data management service. All the things that is on the uh, banner of Cessnet over there. I'm just going to talk about network. Uh, but I'm going to take a completely different angle, as I said. I'm going to take the global angle. What is happening on a global scale in research and education networking? And I can tell you there's a lot happening there. Uh, my talk, first a few words about Norginet and a few words about global internet working. And then why are we doing global research and education networking in the first place and what, are, what is the current state of affairs right now? What are the plans for the future? And then conclusion and some time for Q&A. But first about Norginet. Uh, we are here um, and this is the area served by Norginet. Norginet is a collaboration of the five Nordic NRENs. Um, and we glue the five Nordic NRENs together and we connect the five Nordic NRENs to the rest of the world through Géant and through other means. This is a more close-up of the five Nordic countries. Um, so these are the names of the NRENs in the Nordics. Uh, if you look at the Nordinet organization plus the Nordic NRENs, you see that we serve roughly one million users in the five countries. Um, we are a staff of roughly 25 people and uh, we are owned by the five Nordic NRENs. Norgenet is an old organization. Uh, I think we're one of the oldest NRENs in Europe. Um, next year we will celebrate our 40th anniversary. And that will be a big event on Iceland. Norgenet helps the Nordic NRENs to be NRENs. So Norgenet helps uh, on connectivity scale, but we also do a lot of above-the-net services for them. So as soon as two or more Nordic NRENs have a common interest in developing a service, they look to Norgenet and Norgenet will provide that for the Nordic NRENs. And what we see many times is that to ask for it, we build it together with the Nordic NRENs, and then they deliver that to their users, to their research and education users, and then other NRENs in the Nordics jump on that bandwagon. As I said, we provide um, European connectivity through Géant and uh, we have global links to connect the research and education networks of the Nordics to the rest of the world. Because I think Andreas already said that in the previous talk, research and education are global endeavors. So what we see a lot is that researchers, educators as well, work together within their region, but also have collaborations going all over the world. When we talk about providing IT services, we don't build them from scratch. Well, there is some, there's a lot of software development happening in Norginet, but most of the services we deliver, we do through system integration. So we look at the market, what can the market provide, and we integrate that into a common service delivery. Uh, examples are a video conferencing service that is very popular across the Nordics. Uh, we use Zoom at the core of that, and we've built a lot of stuff around that. And uh, for video capturing of, uh, of lectures and conferences, we use Kaltura. We have a collaboration with Kaltura. 
And again, we have built a whole system around that for storage and for, uh, for streaming. Nordinet's infrastructure is 35, 36 years old today. And we have seen a number of generations, and you see that in the Czech Republic as well. Um, Cessnet has built generations of its network. And we're right now at the brink of a complete overhaul of our network. Nordinet owns a lot of fibers today in the Nordics. So we connect the five Nordic NRANs on dark fiber. We put our own photonics gear on it, just like Cessnet builds the national network here in Czechia. Um, our next generation network will be completely different. Nordinet will own no fiber. So NRANs in the Nordics owns their fiber, and we are going to use the alien wave technology on top of the NREN fiber to build the virtual Nordinet photonic infrastructure. We're going to put alien wave technology to the extreme here. And that means we will reduce operational costs for the Nordic NRANs and ourselves. Enough about Nordinet. Um, I'm going to take it to the global level right now. This is an old map, as you can see by the way it's drawn. Um, this shows intercontinental cable systems. And um, I, know this, I knew this map already for a long time, and I was amazed that it was created in 1901 by the Eastern Telegraph Company that used this for telegraphy. So this is way over 100 years old. If you look at the infrastructure, the global infrastructure today, there is a nice website, an interactive website that you can go to. You see the URL at the very bottom. It shows all the submarine cables of the world. And these cable systems matter a lot for the internet in general, but also for research and education networks. And then I'm going to show you why. The next slide is a few maps that NRANs have created, or regional collaborations of NRANs have created. You have to look a little... Uh, I needed to look twice on this map, but you see Europe there on the very top left. Um, this is the map of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you see Australia, you see Asia to the left of the picture, and you see the US or North America to the right. And what you see here is all the links of research and education networks crossing the Pacific. All small links, all there for a limited amount of time. Most, are them, most of them are project-based. Here's another example, the Xi'an map. Um, this is Europe in the center of the world, and then the links that Xi'an runs to the rest of the world. Cessnet, of course, is connected to Xi'an, and Xi'an delivers global connectivity here. And here's a, it's a little hard to see, but here's a more global map. Um, the North America and South America in the center. Again, small links for research and education. So if you have a collaboration going with South America and you transfer large files to South America, these are the links that used to be uh, used for data transport. So from Cessnet to Géant and from Géant over some of the transatlantic lines down into South America. All small links, all there for a limited amount of time. And um, a number of years ago, uh, we thought, this is a waste of money and a waste of effort. We have to re-procure those links every time. Um, we are hardly coordinating. Why are we not working together? So through that thinking process came the global network architecture. It's a movement. It's a set of NRANs, a large set of NRANs from all over the planet that have come together to join forces, to have a common vision um, towards um, the global network architecture. And basically, it's very simple. Globally connecting science, research, and education that is on par with what is possible within a country, within a continent. So before this movement, um, within the Czech Republic, within Europe, there was 100 gigabits per second connections, but the transatlantic connections were only 10 gigabits per second. Well, that's a nice bottleneck if you would like to transfer a big file to North America or South America or Asia. So, pulling together resources, um, there's five areas of work here, resource sharing, aligning operational standards. If we can collaborate here, we can have much more bandwidth, much more coordinated bandwidth for a longer time, for less money, and we can do 100 gig across oceans as well. Which means that the bottlenecks across the oceans are removed. 
So basically what we did is we created an architecture, basically a set of documents that we agree to on a global scale as NRENs, and uh, we developed this strategic blueprint where we can, as NRENs, align our investments towards. Of course, we didn't start from scratch. There was a lot of experience already. And Cessnet has been uh, one of the uh, active members of the Glyph community, the Global Lambda Integrated Facility. And from there, started in 2001 already, uh, the concept of Lambda networking came into being. And that has been one of the cornerstones of the global network architecture. And also, light path exchanges. I, I assume that you know what an internet exchange is, that where ISP come together and exchange traffic. Well, for RNE networks, there's a similar thing called an open light path exchange. And also, that concept has been used in the GNA. Oh, and the previous slide also gave credit to Professor Wu from the Chinese Education and Research Network and Dave Lambert from Internet2 who started the whole process for the GNA. Um, as I said, we built the GNA on what we know. We call the open exchange points GXPs, Global RNE Exchange Points. Um, there's big pipes between the GXPs that we together buy and we collaborate with NOx. The, the network operation centers of the participating NRENs um, have common procedures. And that's also a big step forward on harmonizing how NRENs interoperate. And I think Andreas already said that uh, NRENs are very good at looking within borders. Collaboration across borders is very important. And, and that's what we try to do here, at least on the lower layers. There's a few big uh, global exchange points uh, for RNE in Europe, and you can see them here. Um, there's more, but uh, th these are a few big ones. Where are we today with the GNA? Well, we published a number of reference architecture documents. We call them the V1, the version 1 architecture documents, um, alluding to the fact that there will be a V2 most likely, and we're working on that right now. There's a couple of white papers. There's infrastructure that has been defined as compliant infrastructure to these, archi uh, to these architecture documents. Instrumentation is very important. Know what is out there and know how it performs and know how it is used. And then we have, of course, a website. I'm going to dive into the Atlantic Ocean, uh, figuratively, of course. Um, we saw this plethora of 10 gig links across the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, at the high days, it was 25 links. And we have now glued it together into 400 gig links by collaborating. And you see the logos of the organizations that have been collaborating across the North Atlantic Ocean. Jean is in there. Uh, that's, of course, important because that means that the entire Europe, including Czechia, can benefit from uh, what is out here. This is 400 gig worth of bandwidth between Europe and North America. And uh, as uh, Cessnet is a 100 gig infrastructure to many places. Uh, Jean is a 100 gig infrastructure. It means that virtually for you, there is no bottleneck when you collaborate with partners in North America. The network, the research and education network, should be seamless and should not be the bottleneck. ESNet is the energy sciences network of the Department of Energy of the US federal government. They also run 400 gig worth of bandwidth for uh, high energy physics research. So altogether, there's currently today 800 gigabits per second worth of bandwidth for research and education across the North Atlantic Ocean. And we're currently working on uh, having a 900 gig link together with our Japanese colleagues. So now we move from an unorchestrated plethora of 10 gig links into a coordinated architecture uh, infrastructure for research and education uh, with long-term commitment. So we don't have to worry about this every year or every two years. Um, we call this the Advanced North Atlantic uh, Collaboration. Uh, we use it as a proof of concept for the global network architecture. And the idea was, when we started this, there might be other collaborations. Um, that's, of course, needed that other NRENs in the world should take charge, should take care of um, collaborating together as well. And particularly in Asia, that is not always easy. It also meant that the number of global research and education exchange points had to grow, and that is currently growing. So, two years ago, less than two years ago, at the Global Summit 2017 in Washington, um, 
of the of Internet2, the uh, US Research and Education Network, there was a formal announcement about the infrastructure of uh, phase one of GNA. In the meantime, um, and this happened end of 2017, our Japanese colleagues, together with people from Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, pulled resources together together with the United States. And there's a lot of things that you can identify in the United States that were instrumental in creating this. And basically, what we did in the North Atlantic Ocean, Nordinet, Géant and Surfnet, together with North American partners, they now have done as well, uh, roughly a year ago, slightly more than a year ago, across the Pacific Ocean. So that means that if your data travels to Asia, the chances are big that it will travel the route from Cessnet, from your institution into Cessnet, into Xi'an, across the North Atlantic Ocean, across the US, over this infrastructure, in, for instance, into Tokyo, if you collaborate with Japanese researchers, or with Malaysia. That's all interesting, but that means that the traffic goes a long way. So the next gap we, look, we are currently looking at is can we do also, and this would be a first big step forward for research and education networking since ever, um, can we also close the gap on 100 gig between Europe and Asia? The bandwidth across Europe, between Europe and Asia is not big. There's not many cable systems that can transport that. And the cable systems that are there are extremely expensive and or extremely unreliable. There's one cable system that goes along the Siberian Railroad, um, Helsinki down into Moscow, all the way to the Chinese border. Um, there's lots of fiber cuts there, so that's an unreliable system. This is what research and education networks have today. So there's a one gig connection of Norginet from Frankfurt, we have a pop in Frankfurt, to a pop that we have in Hong Kong, one gig, it's very little. Um, there's a 10 gig connection between London and Beijing. Uh, CERNET and Géant are uh, running that link. There is plans to upgrade it, but it's not there yet. Um, and, and so on, there's other 10 gig links. This means that lots of traffic from Europe to Asia and to Australia goes through the North America, which means you, you, you cross oceans twice, the, the latency is long, and, uh, well, bandwidth might be there, but you have the long latency. You burn a lot of money uh, by doing that, or the NRANs burn a lot of money because you have to take this long path. Can we do this smarter? And can we have what we have done across the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean also between Europe and Asia? Well, Japan is working on a 100 gig link to Amsterdam from Tokyo. That's one step. And then we said one link is no link because it can go down and uh, you don't want to fall back to the long path again. So we have started an effort to uh, uh, collaborate with a number of organizations. Uh, this is uh, the picture that the, the Japanese are working on. It's scheduled to go into production end of this quarter. So contracts have been signed, it will be there. But then we said, let's sit together. And these six organizations, so from Europe, it's the same three suspects, Géant, Norginet, and Surfnet. And from Asia Pacific, it's the Singeren Research and Education Network. It's the Australian Research and Education Network, Arnet. And it's Timestar CC, which is a sort of Géant for Asia Pacific region. And these six organizations have been talking together since nine months now. And the idea was, let's see if the market is ready to buy a 100 gig for a long period of time. And the collaboration is called the Collaboration Asia to Europe at 100 gig. This is an artist's impression of what it should look like. It says Geneva, Andreas, but it's not going to be Geneva. It's going to be London. Um, we're quite uh, a long way in making this happen. So you see the Japanese link here, and you see the red link that is the subject of procurement of what we're trying to accomplish. And um, we're not doing this for one year or two years. The current thinking is we're going to do this for 15 years. And that's an extremely long time. You already, Andreas, mentioned that 10 years ahead, looking 10 years ahead is hard. Well, we're trying to conclude a contract here for 15 years, and in NREN times, that is extremely long. But that's what the market of telcos 
calls an irrefusible right of use or an irrevocable right of use. It's a way that you buy this circuit and it will deal with the issue for a long time. Well, I can tell you that I was hoping that I could um, say that we are done, um, but we are waiting for the contract to be signed. So I'm not able and not allowed to tell you, but we have run a European procurement process. Xi'an has been very instrumental in, in, in running this process. And the six organizations I just mentioned are bound to have this circuit um, in our hands end of this quarter. So the Japanese will have a circuit from Tokyo to Amsterdam at 100 gig end of this quarter. And we expect to have the red link end of this quarter as well. And then we have to close the loop between Singapore and Tokyo and between London, it will be London and Amsterdam. But that's easy, these links are already there. So very soon we will we'll have this 100 gig infrastructure. And that means that if you transport large files towards Asia Pacific, it will be using this infrastructure, say, as of the summer of this year. One step beyond is that NRENs have been starting to engage in building subsea cable systems. Um, the NREN of New Zealand, Rayans, they have partnered with a commercial organization called Hawaii that has built a cable system between New Zealand, Australia and the US West Coast. It's, it's, it's operational since a few months now. It lands in Seattle. It's a cable system of 15,000 kilometers uh, laying on the ocean floor with humongous amounts of capacity. And Rayans is what they call an anchor tenant. They can use a part of the capacity that has been put in the ocean. So they also have secured a lot of bandwidth for a long time. And these cable systems typically last for 20 years or 25 years. Um, the, our friends, uh, our colleagues from Australia, from Arnet, has done the same. They have been partnering with Google and they have built a cable system Sydney, Perth, Singapore. They are building it as we speak. It's almost done. So they also solve the, the, the bandwidth problem between Singapore and, um, and, and Perth and Sydney. So they connect the Australian continent well to the rest of the world for research and education. And that's of course important because the SKA, the Square Kilometer Array for Radio Astronomics is, uh, is, is about to go live, or at least there is a forerunner already. Uh, closer to home for me, uh, Uninet from Norway has put in a fiber on Svalbard that's close to the North Pole. And uh, here they partnered with nobody, they did it themselves. There's a very nice video of uh, three minutes or so of uh, Uninet uh, building this uh, fiber system themselves. And uh, I advise you to watch it if you are uh, interested in uh, uh, nice technology. Oops. And last but not least, um, Géant is heavily involved into um, a fiber system between uh, Brazil and Portugal. And this, for the first time, will glue together the European and the uh, Latin American continents, so bypassing the US. Uh, traditionally, and you saw also that on the map of uh, the Eastern Telegraph Company in 1901, everything goes across the North Atlantic and then south. That's true for research and education networking today as well. And this ELA link um, uh, endeavor, um, and they have quite, uh, they're quite close in, in starting to build the link, uh, will give Géant and the Pan Latin American Research and Education Network, Red Clara, uh, an IRU, so 15 years or longer uh, between Europe and Asia, for, sorry, between Europe and uh, Latin America for research and education networking. I'm coming to my conclusions. I have no idea how I'm doing with time. I'm still good? Okay, good. Um, so, I haven't mentioned commercial ISPs at all uh, in my talk. Andreas mentioned it. Uh, I have not, but here I am. Um, what about the commercial internet? Do we need NRENs to build all these big infrastructures for data transport? I've always felt that it was a yes because, well, uh, we're all home users as well, and we know what the internet at home... <coughs> Excuse me. We know all what the internet at home is capable of. Um, Géant, together with Internet2 and Arnet from Australia, has done an interesting test uh, some time ago, uh, where they looked at perform high-performance data transport between Australia and Europe. 
And you see the map here. In Europe, they did it from London through Germany and Geneva all the way into the southern part of the US onto Australia. And what they did is they did it over the commercial internet and they did it over the research and education networks. Uh, you see the number uh, in the Atlantic Ocean there. Uh, they were able to reach 9.2 gigabits per second sustained on the research and education networks. And they tried various paths on the commercial internet and, well, the URL is there, you can see what the results were, but it was to cry about. Um, some um, commercial paths made sure that it could, well, at least at a few megabits per second continue, 10, 20, 30 megabits per second. And some commercial path thought it was a denial of service attack and they shut it off, so nothing came through at the end. But this is the value, I think, of research and education networking on a global scale. Dedicated infrastructure for research and for education. So what we see here is the GNA ideas that Professor Wu from CERNET and Dave Lambert from Internet2 kicked off in 2013 are starting to bear fruit. We see that uh, intercontinental bandwidth is now at the same speeds and the same capacities as what you see within a country like, Cessna, like, like Czechia or within a continent operated by Géant. And we see that other paths are following. Um, I mentioned Europe to South America already, but I'm also glad to see that Africa is also now part of the game. And uh, between Africa and Europe, there already is some capacity, but that's least and short term. Um, but there's big endeavors uh, led by South Africa to have long term uh, high bandwidth into Europe. And Africa to South America is also becoming an opportunity here. Um, Brazil is pushing this and the US is pushing this. So what we are doing right now in this endeavor uh, is more bandwidth for research and education, more resilience. I mean, having one big circuit is not interesting because it will go down. Uh, it's only a matter of when. Uh, so we need multiple circuits and we do it in a sustainable way that it is good for 10 or 15 or 20 years to go. And we do that for less money, because uh, what, what I showed you between London and Singapore, we tested the market and the market gave us commercial prices and they were horrible. And working on the wholesale market, buying an RU for 100 gig, slashed the prices by a factor of 10 or more. So that was quite affordable for our six, orga six organizations. I would like to leave you with uh, a thought from uh, Jim Gadbain. He is the president and CEO of Canary, and Canary is the research and education network of Canada. And what he says is the fees you pay to your regional network, or in this case in, in Czechia, to Cessnet, to the national network, not only connects you to Cessnet, but it connects you to the global research and education network for no additional fee. So by you being connected to Cessnet, you have this connection to the worldwide research and education networks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much as well. Uh, any questions from the audience for Eric and Boss? Not at the moment. I was uh, just thinking, like you hinted it at the very end. You know, what about Africa? We are, you, you have been talking about Canada, America, Brazil, Portugal, you know, like, are, are they not going to be like too much behind? Because this, is, this could actually be quite a dangerous development. Um, thank you for that question. Yes, I mentioned Africa. Um, South Africa uh, has made a big step forward here. And um, South Africa is part of the Ubuntu Net Alliance which is a large alliance of research and education networks in Eastern and Southern Africa. And basically what South Africa has made possible is that uh, they can use cable systems that run on the Eastern part of Africa to Europe and on the Western part of Africa to Europe. And they, through the help of the South African government, have secured an enormous amount of bandwidth for this purpose. So they're part of this. Uh, they recently announced a, a GXP, a, a Global Research and Education Exchange Point in Cape Town, and they have glued that to Amsterdam and to London. So yes, they're part of it now. And uh, the next big step will be having connectivity between Latin America and, uh, and Africa. Um, there's another big opportunity that we're discussing, and that's in Djibouti. 
Uh, it's not the most stable part of Africa, but it's an important cable landing station for subsea cables coming from Asia, coming from Europe, and coming from Southern Africa. So on every part of Africa, you see uh, things happening now. That's There's the, the biggest challenges right now, I think, are um, in Asia, inter-Asia, or I should say intra-Asia, uh, reaching uh, countries like uh, Nepal, Bhutan, um, but Tiny Star CC is working on that, but they need a lot of help. And um, the small nation states in the Pacific Ocean, that's another, uh, well, small islands in the Pacific Ocean uh, with uh, rather small populations, not well served by bandwidth at all. What do you see as uh, biggest uh, obstacles uh, in the international research cooperation, like sharing data, data storage, collaboration of users? The biggest, I, I see a number, but I'm thinking about what the biggest one is. Um, I think the biggest one is, is culture. Um, Andreas said it's very, uh, technolo technologists talk to each other quite easily. Um, on the managerial level, it's harder. Uh, talking to universities, talking to universities, uh, rectors. Um, but also when you see uh, NREN directors talk to each other or e-infrastructure providers talk to each other, um, there's culture differences. Um, there's different uh, ways to approach things. And if you look in Europe, it's not easy. If you look on a global scale, it's much harder. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> not only in the research, I would say. Uh, the last question is, uh, how do you evaluate uh, different EU national legislative regulations like personal data storage, e-privacy versus the trend of sharing, uh, especially scientific data? Sharing scientific data, I think that's a very important thing. Open data, uh, and then the European Commission has been uh, very active in the OESC, um, EOSC, sorry, the Open European Open Science Cloud. Um, data has to be findable, reproducible, and, and the whole fair uh, paradigm. I think it's very important that scientific data is open and is allowed to be shared. <laughs> It's, it's important for advancing science and research. So you're not a big fan of GDPR? And, uh... <laughs> well, I, I care about my privacy, but uh, uh, scientific data, uh, especially anonymized scientific data, should be able to be shared. Okay, any questions from the audience? Máte nějaké otázky? All right, maybe later on still, but thank you so much for your speech. Thank you very much.